sort of longevity habits I'd like to talk about. So the things kind of I think of is like sleeping. Obviously, sleep is very important. And, and I believe you track your sleep. Um, that would be very interesting. But also things like uh, cold showers, um, stress management. Do you, do you meditate? Do you, uh, do you take cold showers? <laughs> All right, so let's 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 take them one at a time. So sleep, yeah. I agree, it, this is huge. I have a video on deep sleep and uh, and and its uh, association with Alzheimer's or an amyloid amyloid plaque. So people who have less deep sleep, older adults who have less deep sleep, have an increased burden of amyloid uh, compared to people who get more deep sleep. So sleep is a huge component. Like you said, that's one of the things that I track here, and I'd argue that that's probably the worst component of my whole approach right now. I'm obsessed with getting good sleep. And for whatever reason, I seem to be doing a bad job of it often where, you know, uh, you know, so I changed my diet where I used to eat all of my calories later at night so that I could get better sleep. So now I'm finishing most of my calories earlier in the day, which limits how many times I wake up during the night. But, um, you know, too many on too many days, I'll wake up about an hour before I'm fully rested and not just fully rested, but before I feel like I'm fully rested. So I feel like I'm constantly sleep deprived. So it's, for me, it's figuring out why am I, why, you know, how, it's easy to say, I'm going to lift this much or I'm going to run on the treadmill. It's easy to say it and do it. But how do you get your brain to sleep X amount and it won't do it? Like, how do you stay asleep when you're asleep? So there's something I'm not doing uh, or it's something that I'm doing that's negatively affecting my uh, sleep quality. Um, for example, uh, so I've been hypothyroid, you know, since my early twenties, you know, I went and got a sonogram of my thyroid gland. They saw that there was some atrophy. So I've been on, th uh, you know, levothyroxine for 25 years. So, um, you know, my diet as a kid wasn't great. I mean, I ate a lot of junk food. You know, my parents let me eat as much as what I wanted. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't grow up with scientists as parents or, you know, nutritionists as parents to teach me the ways I just, you know, moved around a lot and did a lot of exercise to burn off all the cookies and cakes today. And it was a lot, but you know, there are things like, you know, your body needs iodine uh, and at least for thyroid gland, uh, thyroid hormone production. So I wonder if I was, you know, iodine deficient and that may have led to or contributed to my thyroid gland issues. So along those lines, I, I've been eating seaweed for the past, you know, two months or so. And I noticed, you know, this is hot off the presses data that my deep sleep amount has actually been a little bit less significantly different so I can compare because I track that data, you know, all the days I've eaten seaweed versus all of the days that I didn't. And there's a significant difference between those two groups of data, more seaweed, worse deep sleep. So, uh, and hyperthyroidism is associated with, there's some data, you know, a couple of studies with insomnia being, you know, you can't sleep for as long, for as, long as you need to. So, um, you know, it could be that I'm now I'm getting too much iodine that's affecting my thyroid gland function. So that's one of also my current experiments that I'm trying to sort out. Because if you, you know, if I wake up tired, even though I, you know, I did an exercise and it's a quote unquote rest day, um, I'll feel exhausted and won't want to exercise when it's an exercise day. So getting, getting, you know, all of the sleep I need, it's, it's a huge component. And uh, <laughs> I hate to say I'm failing at it, even though I'm trying my hardest, but I'm actively working on trying to optimize you know, the, the, um, the quantity of my sleep, because the more sleep I'll get, the more deep sleep I get. Those two things have been correlated. I've, I've posted that in videos. Um, okay. Cold showers. Another interesting, uh, thought. Um, I wish I, I, I would take more cold showers, but I hate taking them. You know, it's, uh, I, it, it's not hard for me to do it when I'm actually standing in the cold shower, but for whatever reason, I can't, you know, motivate myself to do it for the two minutes, but I should say, in the summer, I noticed uh, an interesting um, thing that my blood sugar seems to be higher in the summers. Now, in my apartment, I only have an air conditioner, and an air conditioner is only in the uh, living room window, not in the bedroom. So in the bedroom, you know, we've got two or three fans, but I've got a thermometer in there. And in the summer here in Boston, the, the bedroom temperature gets to 90 degrees. So I'm going to sleep in a 90 degree room. It's like, it's like a hot box. So I literally feel subjectively worse in the summer, even getting a decent amount of sleep. Uh, and I notice again, my blood sugar levels are higher, whether that's related to seasonal allergies or the hot box in the room. So I started taking cold showers in the summer to try to improve that. And I 
did notice a little bit of an impact on things like my heart rate variability. And, um, but I've got to get an air conditioner in that room. Like, uh, so, but, but co- I try, I tried the cold shower thing, you know, so, and I'm not opposed to it. It's just, uh, I don't know. Um, I think it'd be easier for me if I could just jump into a lake and I do that every day. If I, ju- I don't know. I, it's weird. Right. I'm weird like that. All <laughs> right. So, uh, meditation, um, I wish I could say I meditate, but, uh, I don't, I don't have the attention span and it, it, it relaxes me, which is great, but, uh, it just, it's just not for me. You know, I appreciate people who do meditate. I, I appreciate that it, it helps them in any way, whether it's mental, physical health. I appreciate that. But for me, I, you know, I don't have the attention span. It just puts me to sleep, which is good, but I don't want to take a nap, which is then going to mess up my sleep, which mm-hmm. then puts me in a perpetual cycle of messing up my sleep because I took a nap when I was supposed to, you know, supposed to meditate. Um, all right. So cold showers, meditation. Uh, what else was on that yeah, list? I think that was it. Cold showers, meditation. Yeah. But if those things work, if those things work, you know, so again, I'm, I'm the biomarker guy. I, you know, I, I, if, if you can show me, you know, data that your cold showers beyond the subjective field that you feel better, that they're improving mm-hmm. some metric, go for it. If you if your meditation makes you feel better and you don't have biomarkers to show it makes you, you know, makes you better, but it, you feel better because of it, go for it, you know. Uh, okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. You've been very generous with your time this evening. Anytime. Um, so, uh, please, so you, you have the book, uh, it's on Amazon, right? The microbial burden, uh, it's great read, very detailed about, you know, how the microbes affect, uh, everything, I affect the aging in particular and and like each of the hallmarks. So anyway, definitely recommend it. We will link to that. Um, and, uh, can you, and your website, uh, can you just introduce your website? Yeah, it's michaellustgarden.com. Uh, and then. I've got the uh, YouTube channel. So just Michael Lustgarden, uh, you can find me there. So website, blog, book, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Conquer Aging 122, I'm all over the place, right? You can find me in lots of places. I should mention two, th- two quick things though. So one thing is why haven't I put the book into a uh, paperback or, you know, or a hardcover format like all of your other guests, right? So uh, I kind of like the idea of having it online because I can update it with new information. So if I'm going to publish a book and then it's out of date, you know, the information in it is out of date. I've updated the book three or four times since 2016 with new information. So keeping it online, it's not, you know, for any other reason, but I can update it whenever I like to with new information. Right. So just along those lines real quick, I, I, I noticed yesterday that I've got data in there linking HDL and I think LDL with intestinal permeability in a small study. And after reading that, I was like, oh, I got to take that out because at the time when I, when I, you know, included that study, there weren't many studies on it. And I think I saw a few other studies yesterday where there's, you know, there is, I don't believe that association now. So I can do things like that where I can remove and keep it fresh and updated, you know, over, you know, over time. Uh, so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Okay. So uh, thank you very much and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thanks Richard. Thanks. Take care. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.